the question form. And I would ask two things. One, please move into the aisle when you're ready to ask your question. And Bob will have the mic in this aisle and Dawn in this aisle. And they will hold the mic for you so that your question or comment will be heard. So please, when you're ready with a question, move into the aisle. <clears throat> Three. Secondly, please keep your questions concise and brief so that everyone that wants to can speak. So instead of long statements and summaries, please keep your comment and your questions short so that we can all enjoy it. All right, so we'll begin and um, just move in and start. Thank you. My name is Michael. Um, is this about teaching authority in the church? Anyone who says that you can have a one-sided coin is kind of living in a fantasy world, yet uh, that's exactly the world I think that many or some of our leadership live in. We all know our bishops and popes have authority to teach from God, but that's really only one side of the coin. If we were to pry off the solder and flip the coin over, we'd see the other side, and it's in the form of a question. What is the ultimate authority in the church? And I'd say it's not the bishops or pope, it's actually the truth as the ultimate authority. You could say in brackets, that's God. And who is capable of speaking the truth? Anyone who's moved by the Spirit. Now, if there are enough bishops who actually believe that, then I think we have a chance of changing our church. But if there are more bishops than not who say, no, authority is all about your position of leadership, then I think we've got real problems. So could you comment on that, please? Well, look, I think you've described the situation very well. I mean, Catholicism, structurally, is a hierarchical tradition. There's just no getting around that. Uh, and so you've got the Pope at the top and the bishops, and they're believed to be invested with authority to teach, preach, and govern, right? But there has always been a charismatic dimension to Catholic life as well um, that has precious little to do with hierarchical authority and often is an outright opposition to it. Right? I mean, much of the creative energy in the Catholic Church in the last two or three centuries certainly did not come because some pope in Rome pushed a button. I mean, you know, why did we get the great burst of teaching orders that, that grew up, mostly women, uh, in the 19th century? Okay, because there was a perception that the realities of industrial, industrialization were making old models of education obsolete. There was an, a need to invent some new apostolic model to respond to it. Uh, and creative, dynamic women did that. Uh, and they did not sit around waiting for approval. Uh, and of course, you know, there was this great model in Catholicism of people who were seen as renegades and troublemakers in their own lifetime later being canonized. I, you know, uh, I think of Mother Seton in the United States, right? You know, our famous, uh, in, you know, Catherine Ann Seton, um, who, when she arrived in the Archdiocese of New York, was told by Archbishop Dagger John Hughes to go home because he didn't have any need of her. Uh, and she said, no, I think that's okay. I think we're going to stay. Uh, and she bought property on her own, and of course, within 10 years, was wrapped in a warm, loving embrace by the archdiocese, if it had been their idea all along. Uh, you know, why did we get, uh, you know, the social teaching? Uh, that, of course, flowered in the late 19th century uh, with the uh, Rerum Novaris from Leo the 13th. But, uh, you know, the origins of that were in a widespread perception among Catholic pastors that the church was, lurking, was losing the working classes. I mean, basically, there is a sense that we had lost the educated elite to secularism, um, and we were now losing the working class to socialism or communism or something like that uh, because the church wasn't in any compelling way answering their questions. You know, the groundspring of that social teaching was in the reflection, the theological work and so forth that had been done by people outside the hierarchy, which with time, the wisdom of that was seen by the hierarchy and integrated. 
you know, why did we get the great flowering of the lay movements in the 20th century? I mean, you know, we're talking about Schoenstatt and Larsch uh, and the neocatechumenate and the San Egidio community and uh, the Jerusalem community, the Emmanuel community, on and on. Uh, it is not. Uh, because this was dreamed up uh, in a PowerPoint presentation in a Vatican corridor somewhere. Okay, uh, it's because charismatic lay Catholics, I mean, let's take the example of the Focolare. Uh, a lay Catholic woman uh, by the name uh, of Chiara Lubick, um, who was living in Trent uh, at the time of the Second World War, and Trent was one of the cities in Italy hardest hit by the war, and then basically the city was in rubbles, in rubble. Uh, and after the war, she decided there was a need for a new form of Catholic spirituality that would be lay-led and that would be premised on the unity of the human family, that would seek to promote, promote human, uh, unity in all of its forms. Uh, they quickly became experts in ecumenical and interfaith dialogue, for instance. To this day, they have one of the most long-standing and successful Christian Muslim dialogues in the world. Um, they became engaged in conflict resolution uh, and any number of other issues. Uh, and you could say the same thing about the community of San Egidio, which just does marvelous work on so many fronts, uh, including these days care for migrants and refugees. Um, you know, when Pope Francis went to the Greek island of Lesbos uh, and brought back 12 Syrian refugees with him. Okay. He didn't turn them over to some official Vatican office to take care of them. Uh, he asked the community of San Egidio to do it. Um, and they put them through their immersion language school, uh, helped them find homes and jobs. Salam <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I just had the occasion to interview several of them the other day. They are flourishing uh, in Italy now. Uh, it would astonish you how much their kids are Italian natives. I mean, it's just hilarious. Like, they speak perfect street Italian, you know? Um, and they know exactly which squadra di calcio, you know, which soccer team they cheer for. Um, a, and again, this is not because the Vatican wanted there to be lay movements. Actually, at the beginning, there was tremendous opposition, right? Uh, and there were various efforts to squelch these things and rein them in and deny them permission and all sorts of, of other things. And, you know, here we are 50, 60, 70 years later, and once again, uh, they have become, you know, part of the officialdom in a sense, right? I mean, the Pope every year does a big shindig for the lay movements uh, in St. Peter's Square on the Feast of Pentecost. You know, nothing happens these days uh, at the Vatican without the lay movements one way or another being involved in it. Uh, and the point is, all of this was an example of the charismatic dimension of the church. Uh, seeing a need, inventing models to respond to it, and then over time trying to make its peace with officialdom, right? Um, and to me, that's how this works, okay? I mean, as a, a friend of mine, Father Robert Taft, probably the Catholic Church's single greatest expert on Eastern liturgy, Taft had a saying about life in the Catholic Church, which was, if you want to swim in the Catholic pool, 
sooner or later, you're going to have to make your peace with the lifeguard. <laughs> Meaning, you know, you can't pretend the bishops are going away. Okay, uh, you know, Episcopal leadership, hierarchical governance is part of the DNA of Catholicism. Uh, effective charismatic leadership um, doesn't spurn that on principle. Uh, effective charismatic leadership um, it, it accepts it on principle, but push, pushes that leadership relentlessly to make space for what these charismatic groups are seeing and doing. So you are quite, first of all, let me affirm the premise of your question. You are quite right. The ultimate authority in the Catholic Church is not the Pope. The ultimate authority in the Catholic Church is God as revealed in his son Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, And the Pope, just like everyone else in the Church, uh, is answerable uh, to that deposit. Right? Um, However, uh, on the other hand, that doesn't make popes and bishops ir irrelevant. You know, at the end of the day, somebody's got to make decisions. And I've been covering the Catholic Church, man and boy, for 20 years. Most days, I get down on my knees and thank a loving God that that person who has to make decisions is not me. Two very quick questions. Michael Sean Winters in uh, National Catholic Reporter last week after the Vagano affair suggested that EWTN and, and similar friends would lead a schism in the church. My two questions are this. What do you think the prospects are of a serious schism opening up in the church? And the second question, uh, what do you think of the prospects of the church becoming a third world church? Uh, well, the second one is easier to answer than the first. We have become a third world church. I mean, welcome to the reality of the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I said earlier, two-thirds of our people today live outside the West. By 2050, that share is going to be three-quarters. Three out of every four Catholic men, women, and children alive are going to live outside the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they're going to be living in Africa and in Latin America, and in Asia. Uh, and we have to come to terms with the reality that Western experiences, Western outlooks, Western priorities aren't necessarily the priorities of the rest of the church. They just aren't. Um, and part of having a place at the table in this global family of faith in our time uh, is accepting that truth. Uh, that increasingly, when we come together to plot a course for, for Catholicism in our time, uh, we're going to be listening to Africans, and we're going to be listening to Filipinos and Indians. Uh, we're going to be listening to uh, Argentinians and Chileans, uh, you know, every much as we listen to the usual suspects. Uh, in other words, there are only two ways to think about the Catholic Church in the 21st century. You either think globally or you think dysfunctionally. Okay? Those are the only two options on the menu. Okay? Uh, and let me tell you, that's going to be a little bit of a shock to the system for us. Okay? In general, we tend to speak very confidently about what laity want uh, in our churches. Um, in general, that often aligns with what you roughly might call a progressive Vatican II vision of church. Not necessarily the vision uh, of the rest of the Catholic world, at least on some points. And it's also not necessarily the vision of the younger generation that's coming up uh, through the ranks of the church, even within the West today. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to accept increasingly that being part of this family means we don't always get our own way. That solutions that are going to seem obvious to us, uh, no-brainer stuff, uh, you know, aren't necessarily going to be obvious when refracted through the experience of the rest of the world. I mean, let me give you one classic example, okay? I know right here in Australia that because of the Royal Commission and the bishop's response to it, the issue of mandatory reporting 
of child abuse is very much in the air. Um, and where the rubber hits the road in that debate right now is the seal of the confessional, right? Whether the seal should or should not uh, be eroded um, in order to make it clear that if a priest learns of child abuse in the confessional, that even there he is required to report it. Now, I know there are mixed views uh, on that in Australia, but let me, let me tell you how this idea of mandatory reporting plays in some other parts of the world. Okay? Let me give you the example of India. Okay? Catholics are about 1.2% of the population in India. Now, of course, given that the population is about 120 billion, that's still a significant amount of people. Christians generally are about 2.3%. The Indian bishops have resisted a mandatory reporting policy for child abuse, and here's why. There are significant sections of the country right now that are politically under the control of the BJP, which is the political arm of the militant nationalist Hindu movement uh, in India that is explicitly hostile to the Catholic Church. Generally speaking, the police and judiciary there are entirely under the control of the political establishment. There are documented cases. I mean, you can find a couple of these on YouTube. I'll give you one story. There is a Christian Brothers school uh, in Kerala, and it, it owns some land that was where a Hindu uh, group wanted to put up a new temple. Okay? And they wanted to take this land. They wanted to buy it for the temple. But the Christian Brothers school uh, refused to sell so, uh, what happened next, and fortunately, uh, the priest in question had the presence of mind uh, to turn on his phone and to record this. Uh, the, the Christian brother who was in charge uh, was brought in before the local magistrate uh, and told that if they didn't sell land for this temple uh, at a steep discount, by the way, then he was going to be charged with the rape of a young girl uh, and he would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Okay. My point is that there are parts of the world where the police are out to get you. Okay? I mean, in Australia, you can take for granted the, generally speaking, the integrity, the honesty, the fairness uh, of the police and the judicial system. And in this environment, of course, a mandatory reporting policy makes all the sense in the world. But if you wonder why the Vatican or a pope has not imposed this globally, okay, that's part of the reason why. Uh, and thinking through issues in the church, my point is, involves the discipline of anticipating how they're going to play, not just here, uh, but elsewhere. Uh, so, a short answer, we already are developing church, and that was a Reader's Digest version of what it means. The other part of your question, sir, help me. Schism. Oh, schism, right. Mark of Sean Windows. Right. So the question is, uh, is it realistic to expect that we might have a schism in the Catholic Church? Look, uh, the de facto answer to your question is, we already do. Okay? I mean, you look around. Okay? I would submit to you that sociologically, what we have again, in the Western world, and above all in its most concentrated form in the United States, okay, because we are the mothership of polarization, folks. Um, what we have in the West is not, there is no such thing called Catholicism. I would submit that we have multiple Catholicisms, okay. There is a progressive, you know, sort of Vatican II-oriented, version of Catholicism uh, that tends to have its own meetings and listen to its own heroes and read its own websites and so on. Uh, there is a sort of avant-garde peace and justice social change form of Catholicism. Same thing is true. Has its own meeting circuit, has its own superstars, has its own journals and stuff like that. 
Uh, there would be a liturgical traditionalist form of Catholicism, once again, has its own meetings, blah, 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 moves in its own circles. Um, there would be a neocon political form of Catholicism. There would be a culture warrior version of Catholicism, and on and on, okay? Now, look, I mean, the problem is not, in principle, that we have all of that. No, I mean, diversity is a remarkably healthy thing. You know, um, diversity is what keeps us from being a sect instead of a church, right? Um, but the problem, and this is too often the case, comes when those different camps stop seeing themselves as members of a common family and start seeing one another as ideological and theological enemies. Okay? And too often that is actually our situation. I'll tell you a quick story from the United States that brings this home for me. <clears throat> My wife, Shannon, uh, first of all is not Catholic, she's Jewish. Um, and second, she is a special kind of Jew uh, I like to think of her as the founder of a fourth version of Judaism. <laughs> you know? So you've got conservative, orthodox, and reform, right? I think she's a fourth, and it's Obama messianism. <laughs> okay? She thinks the Savior came and went, basically. Um, and the idea now is just to keep his flame alive, you know? Um, she is the ultimate in... Oh, God, you know, Birkenstock-wearing, whale-saving, um, granola-crunching, Prius-driving, you know, liberal chic, okay? Um, and when we moved to the place we live in the United States right now, uh, it's a suburb of Denver called Stapleton. This is after we had decided we weren't going to live in Rome full-time anymore. We first lived in New York and then moved out there. Uh, you know, voting data was very important to her. Um, she wanted to find the bluest of the blue neighborhoods, right, where you'd have to work really hard ever to meet a Republican, <laughs> okay? Um, and so she, she picked this place for us. It's, as I said, it's this neighborhood called Stapleton. We live in this row of brownstone townhouses that looks for all the world like you're on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Okay, and that was deliberate. And um, when I'm there, which is actually quite rare, I mean, I actually live in airport departure lounges, but <laughs> on those rare occasions when I'm home, there is this eatery in our neighborhood that Shannon likes to take us to for breakfast on Saturday morning. You know, totally vegan and, you know, new age and all of this stuff. Um, I mean, let me just put it this way. If secular liberalism had a chapel, this is where they would go to worship. <laughs> okay. And the way I like to amuse myself uh, on those occasions when Shannon takes me there is plunk myself in the middle of the restaurant once we're seated, and then in a loud enough voice that everyone else can hear, I'll say things like, Honey, you know who I think gets a bad rap? Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really misunderstood guy. The last time I tried that, my wife looked at me and said, Well, next Saturday, just bring your white sheet and burning cross. <laughs> Well, that's where we are in America, folks. You know, we live in, and, and to some extent, I would say it's true elsewhere. We live in a culture of gated communities, okay, of both the physical and the virtual sort, where we interact, rub shoulders, talk with only people who think like ourselves, okay? Uh, that's true of how we work. That is true of how we recreate. Uh, and unfortunately, it is true of how we worship most of the time. I mean, I don't know about Australia, but I will tell you that I can parachute into any diocese in America. And within five minutes, if I find a Catholic in the know, they can tell me where the Vatican II parishes are, and where the Tratty parishes are, and where the social justice parishes are, and where the Smells and Bells parishes are, you know, and on and on. Right? Uh, and that 
is unfortunately uh, that is the stuff of schism. I mean, I, I would say that in reality, we've been living in a kind of slow moving de facto schism probably since the mid John Paul years um, that has become more and more visible, uh, more and more acerbic today. Uh, in part, uh, thanks to the electricity generated by Pope Francis and just the fact that you can't help reacting to him. Um, and in part, by social media. We simply have many, many, many more outlets, okay, uh, for these Catholic subcultures to make themselves heard, to make themselves visible, to attract new support, and to attack others, okay? Um, and so I think that's the practical reality. Now, are we going to get a formal schism? Look, I don't see the ingredients for it right now because ecclesiastically, uh, in order to get a real schism, you have to have a bishop or bishops willing to lead it. Um, and right now, I, I don't see any of the conservative bishops, however upset they are with Pope Francis, um, who are going to formally lead a chunk of the church away the way that Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre did uh, after Vatican II um, when he founded the Society of St. Pius X. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe Bishop Athanasius Snyder in Kazakhstan, one could maybe see it developing uh, in that direction, but if so, um, it would be small uh, I mean, it would be smaller than the Lefebvre schism, for sure. Um, and beyond that, I, I don't see anyone else who is prepared to play that role. So I'm not as worried about formal schism, to be honest with you, as I am about this informal de facto schism that I think is one of the central distressing truths uh, about Catholic life in our time. John, thank you and your colleague from Crux for uh, keeping us informed internationally about what really goes on. Thank you. Uh, you have excellent taste in literature, sir. Beg your pardon? You have excellent taste in literature. And I'd like to congratulate your dear wife on her uh, encouraging you to uh, um, have a broader view. <laughs> Hey, I, I think I'm the one with a broader view. I would, act, I would actually talk to a Republican. That's more than she'd do. Anyway, much shalom to her. Uh, Francis has spoken many times about the evils of capitalism. On one of those occasions, uh, he was greeted by uh, some of the American bishops uh, describing him as a Marxist. He made a similar, some comments about the evil recently in the last few days and um, that issue was brought up by, with a prominent American cardinal who made what seemed to me um, rather disparaging comments about, uh, I can't remember the, the exact quote, but the general uh, gist of it was that uh, uh, there's a certain... Uh, um, Argentinian uh, edge to much of what the Pope says. Um, Francis has also spoken on other social issues, um, migration. Now, I'm wondering uh, what the third world, and uh, certainly uh, we don't see a great deal about the evils of capitalism being addressed by our, our hierarchy. In terms of the upcoming Senate, there is a, a big issue uh, for young people okay. uh, in that uh, there's unemployment in, in this country and wages have not increased over the last three years. I'm just wondering whether you'd like to make a comment. I've raised many issues there, but uh, particularly it seems to me the church doesn't generally take much notice about France's social issues in the tradition of Rerum Navarum. All right, well, uh, to the extent you, you referenced disparaging comments about Francis from an, an American cardinal, I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but not at all surprised to hear it. Um, I mean, let's begin with a basic premise. Okay? That basic premise is there is opposition to Pope Francis at the senior levels of the hierarchy. That is a plain fact. 
Uh, let us add to that, there was also opposition to Pope Benedict at the senior levels of the hierarchy. There was opposition to Pope John Paul at the senior levels of the hierarchy. In fact, there was opposition to St. Peter from the senior levels of the hierarchy. <laughs> this is not a news story, okay? Pope Francis is the 266th successor of St. Peter, and he is the 266th successor to have problems with some of his bishops. Okay, the only novelty, well, there are two. Uh, one is that it's coming from somewhat different quarters now uh, than it did in the Pope Benedict and John Paul years. It's like, you know, the, the shoe is on the other foot to some extent. Uh, and uh, that it's louder and more visible and more instantaneous because of the social media age. Okay, but the basic principle here, uh, that there are bishops who don't share the entirety of a pope's agenda, of course there are. I mean, there are more than, there are 5,300 Catholic bishops in the world, ladies and gentlemen. The idea that they're all going to be marching in lockstep is fantasy. Okay? Uh, so we should not be scandalized or overly stunned in any way uh, to see the fact that there is disagreement. There certainly is a cohort of the episcopacy, and it's probably especially strong in America, that has had ambivalences about aspects of France's agenda from the get-go. It doesn't mean they're against everything, but there are certainly elements of it that they don't care for. And by the way, we are seeing echoes of some of that conservative Catholic, uh, what, uh, ferment about Pope Francis play out on another front right now, um, which is the bombshell accusation dropped a couple of weeks ago from a former papal ambassador in the United States, uh, Italian Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, uh, that Pope Francis was informed of sexual misconduct concerns uh, about then Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. He's now ex-Cardinal McCarrick. Uh, but the Pope was informed about them in 2013 and essentially ignored them, did nothing with them for five years. Um, if you want to ask the question, is that accusation being supported, aided and abetted uh, encouraged and sustained by an organized network of conservative Catholics who are opposed to uh, many aspects of the Francis papacy that have nothing to do with child sexual abuse. Okay. Is that charge being supported by such a network um, that is primarily in the United States, but with strong allies uh, in Italy. I mean, if you look at the journalists who have now acknowledged helping Vigano prepare his 11-page statement, which included that bombshell allegation, uh, they include uh, Aldo Maria Valli uh, and Marco Tosati, two of the best-known Catholic Vatican writers in Italy, both definitely would be seen as strong conservatives, unabashed conservatives. Okay. So if the point is, is there a, does this accusation come wrapped in a political agenda? Yes. Uh, however, I would emphasize to you that that doesn't settle the factual question uh, of whether the accusation is true. Uh, if there is one thing we have learned through bitter experience through decades now of the clerical abuse uh, scandals, it is that you cannot simply dismiss an allegation because you don't like where it comes from. Okay? So we have to separate the political agenda at work here. And yes, these guys would love any opportunity to weaken the Pope, to undercut the Pope. Absolutely. We should not be blind to that. Okay? Uh, but it doesn't comprehensively answer the question. Uh, at the heart of all this. That question is, at some point, going to have to be answered. Okay. Uh, you know, is it true that uh, we don't talk as much about the Pope's social agenda? I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I mean, in Europe, there is and has been for a long time, for the five years of Francis's papacy, a very robust public debate about his line on immigration. Um, and as you may know, he's had some difficulty selling that line to Catholic countries in Europe. 
I mean, Poland and Hungary are now governed by coalitions that are hostile to immigration. Italy itself, the Pope's own backyard, is uh, governed by an appropriate, for, this, for Italy, an appropriately bizarre coalition uh, of a kind of left-wing populist movement premised on good governance and a right-wing populist movement premised on, well, xenophobia uh, in Italy for the Italians. Uh, they have begun implementing more sharply restrictive immigration laws, and I will tell you, the Pope's position on that uh, and comments from those who can speak on behalf of the Pope, such as the President of the Italian Bishops' Conference or the Vatican Secretary of, the Secretary of State, those are very much integral elements of that debate. Um, I think Laudato Si, his 2015 encyclical on the environment, um, you know he brought that out in the summer of 2015 because he wanted it to have an impact on the Paris Climate Change Accords, uh, the UN summit that took place in Paris in December of that year. Uh, and it did. A lot of people would, would credit Pope Francis with being the, the, the sort of moral inspiration, the chaplain, if you like, uh, to the press for strong climate change limits uh, in that document. And I think that's been widely discussed ever since. Uh, you know, just the other day, Pope Francis tweaked the catechism of the Catholic Church on the issue of the death penalty, uh, basically making it clear that there are no circumstances today under which the death penalty is morally acceptable. That caused a widespread ferment, uh, obviously, especially in countries that still use the death penalty, uh, mostly my own, um, where there are certainly a number of Texas Catholics that wouldn't be on board with the Pope on that one. Okay. Um, so, no, I don't think it's that his social agenda has been overlooked. Um, I think he's actually been quite artful. Uh, at putting his social agenda on the table and selectively moving the ball. I mean, let's remember, Pope Francis also gets credit for helping stop a Western-led military intervention in Syria uh, in 2013. Um, we know that the United States and the UK and France were ready to, to expand their presence, their boots on the ground in Syria to try to bring down Assad after an alleged chemical weapons attack then, uh, and it was the Pope who appealed to the G7 um, that ultimately averted that conflict. I mean, he was credited by Vladimir Putin and Barack Obama alike with having had that effect. Uh, we also know uh, that in 2015, Pope Francis was instrumental in paving the way for the ending of Cold War tensions between the United States and Cuba. Uh, again, both President Obama and President Raul Castro credited the Pope with having created a, a context in a way through letters he had written that made reconciliation possible. So I don't, I don't think it's the, the, the Pope's social witness has been ineffective, but if the point is that that social witness is not shared by everyone, both at the top and the bottom of the church, you know, my answer is, of course that's the case. I'm, I'm sort of tempted to say, welcome to Roman Catholicism. Okay? Here's the thing, folks. John Paul's papacy went on an awfully long time. He was pope almost 27 years. And at the end of that papacy, he would have given you a laundry list of unfinished business. You know, things he wanted to accomplish that he never got done. Uh, and if you were to ask, was the Catholic Church in 2005, in every respect, a perfect reflection of John Paul's vision? No, not at all. And the same thing could be said of Pope Benedict. I mean, the proof of which is they didn't exactly elect a clone of Pope Benedict after him did that. Okay? Uh, and so Pope Francis, the longer he goes on, the more opportunity he is going to have to appoint senior leadership who share his vision and who can embody it and make it real in their local environments. There will, of course, therefore, be a consequent culture change in the church, but never expect it to be complete, never expect it to be comprehensive, because the thing of it is, ladies and gentlemen, 
Because the Roman Catholic Church is simply too big, too complicated, too riotously cacophonous to ever move in only one direction at a time. And frankly, thank God for it, because that's what makes it so damn interesting. <laughs> okay. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>